My name is Terry Eater. I teach AP Music Theory at Lovejoy High School in Lucas, Texas, a town near to Dallas. And uh, I've been doing it for quite a while, so I'm excited to talk with you about the first topic in the, the uh, course and exam description, topic 1.1, pitch and pitch notation. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about our present system of music notation. And it evolved from way back in the 13th century. A treatise by a guy named Franco of Cologne contained the fundamental guidelines which led to our modern notation. And it's developed gradually since the 13th century. And certain graphic details like the shape of the notes and clefts have changed over time. But this is still the same notation system that began way back in the 13th century. So let's talk about that notation system. I'm going to give you some guidelines for notation in music manuscript, writing music on a piece of manuscript paper. Number one, I think we probably know this one. Music is written on a five line staff and the stems of single notes within a staff should be about one octave in length, as you see right in this example. When we have number two, single line melody in a staff, for note heads above the middle line, the stems go down and notice that they attach to the left side of the note head. And of course, for note heads below the middle line, the stems go up and notice that they attach to the right side of the note head. That's very important to remember. For note heads on the middle line, it's a little bit interpretive. The stems usually go down like in that first measure, but in the second measure when the surrounding stems are up, like you see in the third measure also stems up on that note, then the, the note head on the middle line has a stem that goes up also. Number three, when stem notes are placed on ledger lines, and remember ledger lines simply extend the staff, the five lines of the staff, those notes, the stem should extend to the middle line of the staff. Number four, when notes are connected by beams like eighth notes and smaller notes, they should be modified so that the beams are most often slanted not always, as you can see in the second measure, sometimes they're straight across when the notes go up and down, but then the slant shouldn't pass more than about one staff line for, from, per two notes. Uh, sometimes at the beginning of the year, I see students and they write that slanted line going almost straight down. It's gotta be a very gradual slant. Number four, when there are two melodies on the same staff, Usually it stems up for the higher melody and stems down for the lower melody. And we're gonna encounter that quite a bit in our work in AP. Number six, beaming groups of eighth notes and smaller values. We beam those according to the beats in the measure. So like you see in the first measure, when two, when the second beat arises, it's still with a note that's beamed to the first beat. So it wouldn't be a correct way to do it. You have to look at the second measure where the beats are all defined. One and two and a three and. Number seven, using flags. We use flags for eighth notes and shorter notes like 16th and 32nd notes. And when they're not grouped with other notes within a beat, they have that flag. You can see the is an eighth note, the last note is an eighth note, and in the middle there is another eighth note. If it was a sixteenth note, it would have two little flags and so on. Number eight, irregular divisions of a beat or measure. These are indicated by showing the number of notes in the resulting group by means of an Arabic numeral, for example, triplets, duplets, and even a quadruplet in this example. Number nine, very important in compound meter. For example, in nine eight, once again, we want to show the basic pulse structure of the measure and the division of the three beats as clearly as possible. So in this case, 
the first one is incorrect where there are four notes beamed together because in compound meter, typically in nine, eight or six, eight, we only beam three notes at a time, like in the second measure, and that helps define the beats. Number 10, the whole rest. It can be used to indicate a full measure of rest in any meter. So like there are only three beats in a measure of three, four, but that's the whole rest. In, in six, eight, there are two beats subdivided into six. There's still a whole rest that can, takes care of the rest value. Number 11, when we have rests in three, four meter, use two quarter rest rather than a half rest to define the beats as in this example. Number 12, notes of a chord on an adjacent line and space. When two notes of a chord are on an adjacent line and space, the higher of the two is always to the, re the right, regardless of the direction of the stem. So you can see the higher of the notes that are the second, the, the space to the line, line to the space, those are to the right. Dotted notes, and we'll talk about this a little more in the next video. When a dotted note's on a line, the dot is usually placed slightly above the line, but when two separate voices are placed on a single staff, notice in that second measure, the dots in the lower voice are below the line, okay? Finally, accidentals. When a pitch requires the use of an accidental, a sharp, a flat, or a natural, that accidental always should be written on the left side of the note head. You don't put it on the right. And some, we say the word F sharp, but really we should say sharp F, that accidental goes on the left. So here's a little practice for you to try. And I normally do a writing uh, exercise with my students at the beginning of the year like now. So copy this down and make it look exactly like this. And it will practice your writing skills. Here's what we should take away. We want to work to refine those music manuscript notation skills using these guidelines that I've shown you. And most important, always write with a pencil, hey, and be sure it has an eraser. And so now it is time to go practice.